Great. Thank you guys for having us. <laughs> so my, I'm Unmul Chad. I, I lead the uh, Equitable Futures Lab, which is a project of the Institute for the Future based in California. And I realized that the Equitable Futures Lab is essentially the Bay Area or Silicon Valley translation of the Center for Equitable Growth, mm -hmm. right? So you guys have a center, we're a lab, got the equitable, equitable, growth, futures, the same, 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 same thing. except our upstairs uh, neighbors is Tinder, who works right upstairs from us in Palo <laughs> I think it's probably a little bit different than the equitable growth office. Um, but with, uh, with that in mind, um, I want to introduce this Fantastic panel. I'll start from the, the, the far side over there with um, Tom, and I'll keep the intros pretty short because I know we have a brief amount of time for the actual panel session. Uh, Tom, of course, is the director of Open Society US. He previously served as a CEO of Center for American Progress Action and was a co-founder of avaza.org. Um, was a former member of Congress representing Virginia's 5th District. Cecilia Munoz is um, vice president for public interest technology and local initiatives and New America. Prior to that, she served for eight years in the Obama administration, um, partly as the director of the Domestic Policy Council. Bradley Hardy is an associate professor of public administration and policy at American University, non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, and also a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, Center on Household Financial Stability. And then Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, founder, president, and CEO of Global Policy Solutions, formerly with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, National Urban League, Chief of Staff to Congressman Charles Rangel, staff of House Ways and Means, previous legislative fellow in, in, in Congress as well. So please welcome our panelists here. And I'd like to actually give Maya a few moments to, to, um, to offer some thoughts or comments about your, your late husband. Yeah. So good morning. Is it still morning? Um, I, I am just delighted uh, to give a few brief remarks about uh, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings. I just got a note from a colleague at the Aspen Institute who said that, you know, in all her years of knowing me, she never know, knew that we were married <laughs> 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 until the funeral. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, we've known each other over 20 years. Uh, when I first got to Washington in 1997, he was one of the first members of Congress I met. He gave me an interview for my dissertation on the African-American political response to HIV AIDS. I labeled him a transformational leader uh, in my dissertation. Uh, but we became fast friends, and then it evolved into a relationship and then a marriage. Uh, it is it's with seer, sincere sadness uh, that uh, he passed um, a little over a week ago. And um, the fact of the matter is, is he spent, even though people per perhaps most remember him uh, as a great defender of democracy, uh, because in our democracy, in the pr promise of our democracy, he saw liberation for people of all different backgrounds, particularly those who have been oppressed uh, and marginalized in our society. This is a man who spent most of his career uh, focused on how do we break the structural dynamics that keep people from achieving all that they're meant to achieve and keep them from uh, contributing to the prosperity of America and enjoying in the prosperity of America. And that was informed by his own gr uh, growing up uh, in Baltimore, uh, where he grew up in the Jim Crow South, um, where the geospatial uh, dynamics uh, were such that, you know, African Americans were concentrated in certain locations. They were told that they couldn't go to any other schools except the designated schools. And so what you had was an entire structure, and what you still have, by the way, and I'll get to that, is an entire structure uh, that's basically um, designed uh, to keep people from opportunity. So when we're talking about structural change, and by the way, it hasn't much changed, because if you look at the dynamics of Baltimore today, and Raj Chetty and his colleagues have done some great work about the lack of opportunity uh, in places like Baltimore, you still continue to see the same geospatial dynamics. So with that, what I just want to say is, is that he was a great champion uh, for uh, equitable growth. Uh, and so we must all continue his legacy. And I thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, and I do think this seems, this panel is uh, 
focus on structural inequality is uh, and structural changes seems like a, a very appropriate way to honor that legacy as well. Um, so just as some context, so first I was, I was asked to remind people to submit questions through the platform and also I think there's now a requirement to put your name in there. So I don't know if people were trolling the platform before with <coughs> questions um, or people were setting up questions to ask themselves when they got here. I don't know if Bradley, that was uh, part of the strategy. Um, <laughs> But um, that's not going to happen this time. Uh, so, but just for basic context for this conversation on, um, on, on structural change around inequality, we know we're in the longest economic expansion that's ever been recorded in, in our history. Uh, we have extraordinarily low unemployment rates uh, by historical standards. I think today just ticked up to 3.6% nationally. Of course, the black unemployment rate is higher, 5.4%. Um, which is about what the white employment rate was five years ago. Um, and at the same time, we have a very tight labor market, very strong economy in terms of aggregate measures of growth. And the most recent census or ACS data show that we have the highest level of inequality that has ever been recorded as well. So that's just a sort of, that's the basic high level context. And I wanted to start off and kick it off with, with Bradley to talk a little bit about um, our research on economic mobility and the big picture there. And if you could start actually by, listing out or, or sort of your three key points or three big takeaways that you'd want people to 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 take away from the, the story you want to tell. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that much of what I'm going to say echoes uh, much of what Maya led off with, uh, frankly, that, look, to start off, um, you know, economic mobility, it, just how children are faring relative to their parents, um, you know, it's fairly low in the U.S. on average, the ability of kids to move up the economic ladder. And so we just have more and more uh, quantitative evidence uh, of this fact. And that research body uh, in economics is you know, roughly 30 to 40 years old. And, and so um, interestingly, we've seen these mobility trends. Too. Yeah, it is. And sociology yeah. as well. Yeah. And sociology. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I can come back to that yeah. later. That's exactly. There's a cross-disciplinary literature. Right, right. This. Exactly. So uh, you know, it's interesting. It's worsened uh, throughout the 1980s. So my birth cohort. Uh, you know, 8082 um, has done worse on mobility uh, outcomes, right? And, and so um, returns to education have gone up, so inequitable access to that's going to drive it, inequality going up. Mm -hmm. That's a big driver. Uh, access to uh, the bundle of great things in higher quality neighborhoods, mm -hmm. i.e., safety, uh, high quality schools, these sorts of things uh, matter quite a bit. Uh, and so we just know that family background matters. Um, the ability of parents to uh, purchase those resources, um, you know, parental education and income matter greatly. Now, so that'd be one point. Um, you know, the second point would just be that, you know, frankly, the transmission of economic status does have a, a very clear demographic and geographic gradient, right? So one, um, uh, low mobility uh, is worse for black Americans. It's worse in the Southeast. Uh, I'm born, raised, and educated in the South. I love the South, so I'm not trying to pick on the South, but uh, those are the, the statistical facts. Um, there is variation, though, within even cities that look bad. Uh, there's pockets of upward uh, mobility, um, you know, neighborhoods where folks are doing better than others, right? Uh, so it depends on the, the snapshot you take. Um, but we got to take a look at public policies there. And I know the, the panel will get into this. Um, you know, there's clear differences, things like um, access to supplemental earned income credits, minimum wages, union protections, so on and so forth. And then just, you know, finally, I just say that, you know, as a fact, you know, economic inequality and the low mobility that it's causing, it's not inevitable. Uh, I, th I think we know across social sciences that uh, the safety net works to improve long-term outcomes. Resources matter for higher educational attainment, uh, closing racial uh, educational gaps, so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot that works. There's a lot that we can improve upon. Yeah, that's great. So I think the, the social safety net, the, you know, you close out that, you mentioned that briefly at the end. I think, Maya, your work touches on this as well, right? The, and especially the real lived experiences of people, working class Americans as well, and dealing with social insurance programs. So can you, is there, how would you, you know, could you add to that picture that Bradley's painted and how would social insurance and social safety net programs? Right. I'm a, a proud member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. I think Bill is in the back there. Wave, Bill. Um, but we have... <laughs> We've done a lot of work uh, throughout the years. Since I arrived in Washington in 1997, I worked on the House Ways and Means Social Security Subcommittee. Uh, so I've worked on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, all of the social insurance programs. 
Uh, and, and really what we find is despite historical discrimination in some programs like Social Security, uh, these programs are a, a wonderful uh, support mechanism, particularly for low-income uh, populations uh, and have been uh, a way for particularly low-income populations of color uh, to actually get the resources that they need to sustain themselves uh, in the circumstances that they find themselves. So if we're talking about Medicaid or Social Security. Um, uh, so, you know, one aspect, for example, of Social Security is people think of it as an old age program. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is this one of the, the nation's largest anti-poverty programs for children. Uh, that's especially important for children of color. Uh, and so when you look at the data, you know, we've done research that shows that approximately the, the Social Security Administration reports that they have 3.2 million children that they're supporting through Social Security. But when you actually look at the family unit uh, who's actually living in a household, and uh, many children in the, of low income status live in extended family households where someone is getting a Social Security check, when you include that broader data, uh, you understand that that number actually doubles uh, to 6.2 million of American children. So, the, you know, across the board, um, social insurance programs play an incredibly important role, as do other important safety net programs like, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, lunch program, the school lunch program, uh, breakfast programs that are evolving, et cetera. So these are important, uh, and we should, of course, I know that you wouldn't, uh, but, you know, the nation shouldn't uh, ignore their importance. Uh, for making sure that there is some measure of economic stability in lower income households. That's great. So we talked a bit about economic mobility at sort of a macro level um, and then the social policy component as well, right? And I think one of the things that's hanging over this is, what, is especially what's going on in the labor market, right? And so Cecilia, I was hoping that you could speak a bit about the work that you've been doing around um, skills and job, job training programs and especially around how those are being implemented in some of those shortcomings. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. I should point out that I have colleagues sitting in the room from New America, Bridget Schulte, who leads our Better Life Lab, and Amanda Lenhart, who's a co-author of a study that, that we're about to release, and I promise not to scoop it, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, so we're in a conversation about, about work, about the quality of jobs, which is tremendously important, but also about the ways in which work is changing, that, that, that the nature of work is changing, the impact that automation is going to have on the workforce. And we're at, I work at New America now, and we're trying to um, focus in on making sure that we're actually engaging the workers who are going to be affected by this in the conversation about what it means and what we might do about it. Um, and so Amanda has co-led a research study where we talk to a bunch of workers who are in sectors of the economy that are likely to be affected by automation. And it turns out, first of all, that when we, when we talk about sort of the future of work and what automation is going to do, the coverage tends to focus on factory floors and truck drivers, occupations uh, held um, uh, traditionally by men. What the data shows is that there's a disproportionate impact likely to be felt by women, office workers, retail workers, um, particularly women of color. And so, um, and so that's who we went and talked to. And there, it, it's it, interesting to me that there is so much focus, and rightfully so, on making sure that we're providing workers with the skills that they're going to need in the, in the kind of tech, uh, in technology and the kind of economy that we're building. So there's a vast conversation about kind of delivering training programs for workers, which I think is important. But when we talk to workers themselves, there's a real skepticism. I mean, I think the, the assumption that everybody's going to need to learn how to code is not the answer to um, making sure that we have workers who are adequately prepared for the kind of economy that we're building. Um, and there's a lot of skepticism about training programs in general, in part because workers are living lives and they, you know, they have jobs, they have children, they have transportation needs, they have other needs, which means that they, what they said to us was that we're much more interested in kind of, if there it needs to be training, we're much more interested in it happening in, in our jobs rather than separately. Um, and we heard some very interesting skepticism about if what this means is that I need to train to become a manager, I'm not sure that's actually what I want in my life because those people have even less control over their lives and their time and their schedules than I do. So that suggests to me that there's a real mismatch between where the conversation is going and who the people are that this conversation is about and what they want and need and are interested in. And that suggests to me that if we're going to be developing policy and delivering policy, we really should be doing it in collaboration with the people who are the point of the policy making exercise in the first place. 
Um, and one of the things that Carmen Rojas said earlier that really resonated with me is that we, when you, if you start with technology, very frequently you're asking the wrong question. But what we're learning is that if you bring the skills of technologists to this question, um, we have tools that allow us to engage people in the design of the policy which affects them. And for all of the conversations that we're having today, we should be using those tools. We, uh, it's important that we do research, that we do analysis, that we go where the data takes us, and it's equally important that we engage the folks who are at the point of this exercise in the first place because we now have tools that can allow them to help us design the things which are going to affect them, and we should, we should use them. Yeah, and, we'll, and, then, and also what are the underlying ideas that are shaping those policies, right? So it's not just a, like a technical fix, right? But led by engineers. Right? Well, well, exactly, I mean, I think we, and I say this lovingly as a, you know, career policymaker, of course we're trying to make policy on the basis of what the evidence tells us, um, but a lot of what we do is guessing. Um, and, and we don't have to. Um, and we don't do nearly enough to engage um, the folks who we're talking about. Yeah. And we will get to better results if we do. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I want to come back to that because we, uh, in California, part of what we're doing is we're coordinating the uh, California Future of Work Commission that the governor created this year and are, are a few convenings into that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I want to pull back to you on with that. I want to give Tom a chance to jump in here. Um, and, and, you know, we are, we're, we want to talk about structural changes, right, and, and, and structural reforms, um, especially with, with the building on the labor market conversations, right, that Cecilia laid out. So how do you see, what do you, for you, from your vantage point where you, where you work and, 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 and the, the activities that you're engaged in, what's the, what are the opportunities for structural reform? What are the challenges now? Um, do you see the economic context or political context working providing a window of opportunity for that, or is, it, is that window closing? What do you think? Um, <clears throat> so first of all, let me just say to, <clears throat> um, to Maya, uh, when I got to Congress, um, Chairman Cummings was incredibly um, kind to everyone who was a first member, like first year helped mentor a lot of us. And whenever we had a tough vote, so many members would point to the polling numbers or whatever else. And whenever I would ask him for advice on a tough vote, he said, listen to your constituents and then follow your conscience. And he was just an unbelievable uh, mentor to so many of us <clears throat> on the Hill. So I just really want to uh, express my appreciation there. Um, I think we need to understand, and I think it's come up in several parts of the conversation, the interrelationships of power. Uh, economic power, corporate power with democratic power and with racial power. Um, and we see right now an unbelievable concentration of wealth, but that concentration of wealth is able to translate itself into economic, uh, into political power that affects the ability to produce results for people, for the very parties that want to build power or organizations that want to build power by being able to show that they are standing up for working class people, uh, middle class folks of all races. And we have to start you know, bluntly from a reality that there are very few examples through human history, including American history, of multiracial democracy existing with genuine equality of voice. Um, we have had lots of hierarchies, whether by tribe or sect uh, or elsewhere uh, or other types around the world. But to sustain that kind of multi-identity democracy is difficult in part because of how people play and divide those with power can divide it in order to prevent the building of power. And so we're really looking both at this question uh, of corporate monopolistic power right now, both in its traditional forms, uh, of which we have a great deal, along with this new generation of uh, monopolies that are also adding control of information, uh, both private and public, into those spaces. Um, and so the challenge is great. On the flip side, I would actually say there has never been this much multiracial majoritarian support for the kind of reforms that many of us are talking about, whether that's reimagining capitalism, reimagining sectoral bargaining, whether that's reimagining a living wage. Uh, I'm not a UBI fan, but that type of conversation, right? You're having a set of conversations right now about much bolder reforms, many of them with a lens of power on them. So I think we have these multi, um, uh, th these intersecting forces of either concentration of power versus democratizing of power that we see, uh, including in the philanthropic sector, which I think has rightly come, come into a fair amount of criticism, both of how it operates, but also how 
its use can justify some of the more uh, unequal economic policies um, uh, that get put out there. Um, so we do need this, uh, to, to many of the things that were put out there, it's absolutely essential for building power to be able to deliver results in a governing sector. And I think that's why cities have been so interesting is to some extent it's been a little easier to see innovators there break through some of these systems. But power does pull back. Uh, our organization was involved in helping to get a number of reformist prosecutors elected um, across the country, uh, many of them women of color, and the system is doing everything they can to prevent them from succeeding, uh, whether that's people in their own offices or police or otherwise. So again, that desire, understanding that if people are able to basically access power and then deliver results in that space, that builds additional power and credibility for the kind of structural reforms or reimaginings that we like. And so I think whereas progressives and liberals, which I'm guessing are the majority of people in the room, we're very much rationalists, right? Like we think we can get a white paper out there and data and we absolutely should do that. Um, but the other side tends to think in terms of power. So I think it's not about rejecting reason and fact, we absolutely should be driven by that, um, but also understanding that uh, the other side's playing a slightly different game on this and we need to understand how our work um, lands within that. Wow, yeah, that's sharp. It's so yeah, that's I mean, that's sharp. So that's uh, that's a it's a good perspective on thing on, on framing these issues across the borders. Right? So this applies across the labor market issues, across economic mobility and neighborhoods and education and those institutions as well as social safety net, social policy as well. Um, Carmen Rojas earlier had said something about um, around innovation and work, right, and and how that's being framed. <coughs> what, what, what's usually talked about around innovation and and uh, Cecilia, you were talking a little bit about the future of our conversations as well. Um, and I think that for uh, you know the the commission that we're doing in California, we it's uh, whereas the up till now a lot of the future work conversations had focused so much on technology and automation and the you know mm -hmm. the threat of job displacement from robots um, and it's partly this work is now being driven by uh, to, to shape a vision around uh, economic equity in California, mm -hmm. right? And I think around. Um, Rather than asking what uh, what sorts of jobs or work are we going to have to be doing in the future for robots for our robot managers, right? <laughs> what sort of the, the questions that we want to be asking? <coughs> what is it that we want work and jobs to be doing for us, right? And how do we chart a path to getting there? Um, and so one of the things that, that the commission has really been wrestling with, and I just mentioned that the New America folks from California have been really involved in this as well. And I know they've been doing a lot of great research and projects around the state, especially in the Central Valley and the places that are. Uh, that, that, don't, that, don't, that typically don't get as much attention as the coastal cities. Um, but one of the things that they're wrestling with around work is um, in, in terms of strategies to improve the outcomes for, for low wage workers, right? We can think of, in, in very loose terms, two broad sets of strategies. One that focuses very much on upgrading workers themselves, primarily through skills and training. Um, and then another approach that will focus on upgrading jobs themselves, which are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but sort of analytically it's kind of, it's useful to separate because they do emphasize different points of intervention. Um, so from your, from your perspective and your point, is, is this question on job quality, I should also mention that, you know, this is something you mentioned last week, uh, there's this great research that came out from Gallup and uh, with Omidyar and Gates, some other groups, right, that on, on job quality in the United States for the first time putting real concrete numbers on this. And in this context of strong economic growth, low unemployment, they also found that only 40% of American workers are in what would be defined as good jobs, right? So the majority of all workers across all income groups are in either mediocre or poor jobs. Right. Um, so how do we think about this, this emphasis on either upskilling workers at the individual level versus looking at jobs themselves as maybe a different approach for structural change? So this is an incredibly important point, and I was um, um, struck actually by the chart that Heather showed at the beginning that w like what it might mean if we look at economic growth, but it disaggregated in a way that allows us to see who it's affecting and who it's not affecting. Because it is true, right, that we're in the labor market that we're, that we're in and we're in the economy that we're in, but to the extent that this is a boom, I think certainly when I go back to Michigan, which is where I'm from, and talk to people about whether they are experiencing it as a boom, the answer to that is very clearly no, and that's echoed around the country, and at some level the data really shows us this. So, uh, and it, it's, this is part of the reason it isn't enough to talk about making sure that people are prepared for jobs that we assume will be higher quality jobs, uh, and the jobs which are gonna come into the economy that like haven't been invented yet, 
we also know that some of the sectors of the economy that are growing, where there are going to be jobs and jobs that are not automatable, are also jobs that are kind of not sustainable for the people who are in them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, another one of the things that we're, that we're hearing c coming out of this report that I'm sort of previewing, and you should come to New America on November 21st to hear more, <laughs> um, is that people are leaving jobs that they love uh, in order to move into jobs that they don't love so much, but that they feel that are more secure. And the jobs that they love are caregiving jobs. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be more of those, not less of those. And we have not yet figured out how to way to make sure that they pay sufficiently um, and that they provide the kind of flexibility that human beings need in order to be the human beings that they need to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so this notion, and this is, I say this with all humility because my colleagues who know more about this are sitting right there. But this notion of better jobs being both about wages, but, and, but also the capacity to live your life and care for your children or your parents or, God forbid, yourself, um, needs to be built into our notion of what equity means and what kind of economy we want to build. Mm -hmm. We really need to be thinking about kind of human-centered capitalism, if you will, to make sure that um, as, we, as we devise these policy ideas, as we try to create momentum and build power, um, to, to become the kind of society and economy that we want to become, that we think of this in terms of wages, but we also think of this in terms of flexibility and people's ability to live their lives. Yeah, that's great. So I'd like to just uh, challenge the paradigm of employer-centered uh, job improvement, uh, because I think that's the conversation that we're having in the political realm right now. Uh, and when you see the proposals that are being offered from some of the um, perhaps more left-leaning uh, presidential candidates, you see what they're offering is an expansion of social insurance. Uh, because we know that the nature of um, you know, capitalism and uh, employers as they are now uh, is that they're, you know, they're shedding benefits. Uh, and so the question becomes is how do you actually assure people access to the things that they need to live their best lives outside of what the job opportunities are. Uh, and so uh, we've, we're, we're hearing about you know, Medicare for all, we're hearing about you know, some people are talking about universal basic income. Uh, all of this is outside of the context, and of course we know that half of the jobs in the, in the United States of America, uh, people don't have access to tax preferred retirement accounts through their jobs, and that means an expansion of Social Security as well as a way to get portable benefits regardless of what your employment, uh, your, who, who your employer is or what your employment circumstances are. So I think that is the wave and the moment that we're in right now. Uh, and so, you know, it's a, a critical moment, one where we have to understand the broad range of tools uh, and then how we actually structure society and the assets that we have, the public assets that we have, uh, to meet the needs of families in the 21st century. That's great. So would you say then, do you, would, do you think there's a, uh, either a push or, or, or interest then in, in moving towards decoupling a lot of these key benefits or things that people would expect from employment away from the traditional employer-employee mm -hmm. relationship onto either whether it's state programs or, or, or Yes, and that's, that's what I'm arguing. And the other component of that is, is that then, you know, you know, many of these employers are operating in an international competitive context. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that once, you know, we have this shift, if it happens, and it looks like it may, um, that they actually become more competitive. Um, as a small business owner, I, I know that you know it was not, it was not uh, you know the it was not welcoming for me uh, to have to manage uh, you know employee health care uh, or even retirement programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that you know we can free uh, employers from that uh, burdensome obligation, uh, then we're doing right by employers, and we're also doing to the extent we expand the social safety net and a social insurance in a way that is robust, then we have an opportunity to really uh, make sure that um, uh, people are taken care of as well. Right, and I can imagine that some, so one question that some may ask or, or, or in, in reaction to that, right, is that right now there are, to some extent, there are people in traditional uh, employment relationships with employers that may provide benefits, right, that provide health coverage, and that's part of their sort of total compensation. So how do we think about moving towards this system 
um, in a way that doesn't let employers off the hook from what they are either currently providing or what they should, what people expect them to be providing. And again, this is a part of the conversation. You've heard it in the national debates that we've had over the last uh, several presidential debates. And this is whole, this whole notion of, you know, if you do, if you're one of the half of the, po if you're part of the half of the population that has access to these great benefits to your job, and you want to keep them, um, you know, how do we transition uh, to providing basic? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. And I wanted to get back. I wanted to get back to the this issue around mobility, right, that Bradley had raised earlier, as it relates, you know, so some of this is that it, uh, 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 ha having these universal benefits buffers people, right? It, it protects people against risk or adverse life events. Um, and, and that we know from a lot of the other research that these are the things that then w could lead to downward mobility or, or get in the way or, or be obstacles to people moving from one neighborhood to another when they experience job loss or health issues and things like that. Um, but when we think about, when we talk about mobility, there's, uh, you know, there's, as we mentioned, decades of research in sociology around the uh, per persistence in, in uh, in intergenerational, the lack of intergenerational mobility, sort of like years of research now in economics about this, right, that, is, um, that has put this on the table. And often we think about the persistence of uh, a class status at the lower levels, right, that people who are born into the lowest 20% are likely to stay in the lowest 20%, yeah. people are lo likely to stay in their position, and at the top as well, right, so it's on the flip side of inequality, what's going on at the top, people at the top tend to stay at the top, right, but I think there's a sense, at least culturally or socially, even among the folks in the top 20%, that, uh, that there's like an anxiety, right? That they may not be holding on to their position. And this is something I think that Richard Reeves develops in this idea around dream hoarding, right? Um, and so is that the flip side of the myth of mobility in America, right? That there's, uh, we may believe in the possibilities of upward mobility, but the data doesn't seem to really bear that out. And at the same time, if we believe that there's a smooth uh, process for upward mobility, then there should be a process. You know, there should be a possibility of downward mobility, right? And that's not that may not be true. That's not exactly true empirically, right? That people who are at the top tend to stay at the top. But is it that the folks in that top 20% th think because there's a, a, a mobility in America that their kids may actually fall down dramatically and that they are acting out of anxiety to protect their status? Well, so, you know, so there, there's a lot there. And, you know, part, part of what I want to touch on would be it's not costless for uh, upper income families to maintain the status of their children. And I would even argue that there's some positive spillovers for the sorts of um, uh, policy interventions along the domains of um, well-funded educational interventions, um, you know, tackling the affordable housing challenge. And I want to stay there for a second. Uh, many, you know, upper income families, middle income families are going to find their household budgets strained quite a bit uh, to essentially give their children uh, a, a positive chance at, at, at upward mobility. So you're going to spend more of your household's budget to be in that more expensive neighborhood uh, that gets them access to the higher quality schools that you believe might get them access to higher quality colleges and universities. And so in essence, if you had uh, a more even and equitable distribution uh, of quality, uh, which I would argue costs money and takes revenue, uh, for example, um, you know, you, you are going to have some, some spillovers, not just uh, for, for poor families and low income families. Um, right. I, I think a, a challenge, however, is that, you know, you were talking about the unemployment statistics, they're salient. And this is where it does go way beyond the domain of my training in economics to think about uh, political science. Folks glom on to salience. Um, the unemployment rate's very clear. But there's economic insecurity that's occurring uh, with household budgets, uh, with health shocks, uh, low savings, uh, a lack of emergency savings. And so when you think about that, um, this is certainly hitting our, our low-income families hard. But if you were to look up the income distribution, uh, many families with even high income flows, uh, if that income were cut off, uh, they don't have much mm -hmm. uh, to, to weather the storm. So that sense of insecurity is real. It's, I think so. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And so you mentioned something that, that, that stood out to us really briefly around the costs of some of the necessary public or social investments, right? Or someone, there'll be costs to bear, right? And I wanted to direct this to Tom over there, the, that there's this idea or, or there's a sort of discourse, right, that we tend to look for solutions that are win-win solutions, right? Where everybody benefits, we can fix inequality and risk, uh, lift all boats, and it's good for everybody. Um, 
is it, are we getting to a point now in terms of the the magnitude of inequality where the win-win solutions are no longer tenable? Is it is is there an element of it that is zero sum? Just mathematically, if you're decreasing inequality to to raise people up at the bottom, you're also pulling people who are at the top closer to so people at the bottom, right? So is there is that a necessary part of it, or, is it, or are we still looking for win-win solutions? I mean, I think, it's, I think of that as a little bit of the ice cream versus spinach issue. Um, like, in the long run, everybody wins from a more equitable society, uh, from a more racially inclusive society, uh, from a more climate sustainable society. There's no question about it. Um, does it feel that way today if someone told me to eat spinach, but I had ice cream, a box of donuts in front of me? Like, the donuts taste better, right? So I think that, that it is true <clears throat> that there is in the same way you're not going to get in shape without going on a little bit of a diet and starting to exercise, but you're going to be happier where you get in the end, I would say those people even who have the concentration of power and wealth right now are better off, but I don't think we're going to convince them of that in the, <clears throat> in the short term because, you know, spinach isn't very, or kale is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that that, am I allowed to say that in this town? I don't even know. Um, so I think that uh, we shouldn't try to think we can reason everyone there. I mean, Daniel Markovitz's work right now on inequality and meritocracy talks about the fact that, you know, this huge separation of the top 10% or 1% or however you count it, it's not like their kids are winning. I mean, if you look at anxiety levels, if you look at depression levels, suicide levels, like the, the hyper intensity of that, you'd rather be on the high end of it than the low end of it. We're not trying to create equivalence there. Um, but people are freaked out across this spectrum right now. On sustainability, you know, obviously we only have one planet to work with. But I do think that this is a town, well, one side of this town gets very freaked out about the idea of anyone losing, particularly if those people are donors. Uh, you know, it was interesting when we were uh, looking at every single person in, in 08 had run on, um, you know, extending the Bush tax cuts below 250,000 and retiring above. And I can't tell you how many caucus meetings I was in where everyone was like, well, no, but 250,000 is middle class in my district. And so I did the research, and the, the richest district was Connecticut 5 at the time. I think it was Himes. Uh, maybe in Murphy then. I don't even remember. Um, and that was the 89th percentile in that. Uh, district, right? right? But if you look at it being middle class for the people that show up to campaign events, who show up at fundraising, who are in people's neighborhoods, it is very middle class. And it's not like those people were doing great at that point relative to where they were. So I think, at the, I think this notion of whether taking some of that revenue and investing it in a Green New Deal type, you know, five to 10 year build, investing it in a living wage campaign, and, you know, keeping a public option in there, there are people that would have lost short term. Insurance companies would have lost uh, and elsewhere. Um, other people would have won. Would we be better off as a society on the other end? So I think the, the conservative side is very willing to impose short-term losses for what they believe builds power and maybe gets to a better world. Never know. Um, but I think, yes, sometimes there are things that in the short term will have trade-offs to get us to a better place. And you know, that's part of what leadership is about. I mean, the most dramatic version of this that we're not asking people to do is, you know, you do not order a D-Day invasion if you are not willing to say some people are going to pay the ultimate price. Here, we're not asking people to send people to die. We're just saying you might have to ask some donors to pay a slightly higher marginal tax rate in order for kids across America to have an opportunity to succeed in their education. Um, so yes, I think ultimately we do rise or fall together as a country. We rise or fall together as a common humanity. Um, um, but that does not mean that everyone's going to experience that in exactly the same way at every moment. Yeah. Well, and if I can jump in just to build on the point that Tom made earlier about power building, these things are related, right? The, and at some level, there are beginning to be signs that that at least some folks in, in the corporate sector recognize that, like, maybe it's unsustainable for the gap to be as huge as it is. And, and you know, hopefully that is motivated by all of the all of the right things, but it's possible that some of it is motivated by the visions of people ultimately coming at them with the pitchforks and the torches. Mm -hmm. And what that says to me is like, some pitchforks and torches might not be such a bad thing. Like it, that making sure that, um, that we are uh, engaging thoughtfully in creating the capacity for people again to lift up their own situations effectively and contribute to this conversation feels like it, it, like, it feels like this is a tremendously important moment for that. And so I think it's like we have to be looking at the full spectrum of what it takes to get good policy passed and you know implemented by a government involves the data that leads to the right ideas it involves engaging communities and it involves being deliberate about understanding 
where there are opportunities to build power and making sure we're being deliberate about that. Yeah, great. Pitchforks may not be such a bad thing. So there's an emoji for a pitchfork, I think, in your phone when you tweet that out uh, and attribute that to Cecilia. So I did want to come back to actually, Cecilia, <laughs> in terms of the context, out. the policy context or the political context, especially from your background at the, uh, um, with, around domestic policy in the White House from that vantage point. Right now we have, um, we mentioned we're in the longest uh, uh, economic expansion in history, right? Very low unemployment rates, tight labor markets. We know what we expect. I mean, Heather mentioned that the, the standard rules of economics don't seem to apply in a context of extreme inequality, but we, market economies typically go have ups and downs, right? So we've gone on this, the longest ride up that we've seen in history. It's likely that it'll come down at some point. It's impossible to predict when, but we, you know, there's, we can believe that it's inevitably gonna happen at some point. Um, what does, so we're not very good about thinking in the future about different contexts that are so different than where we're at today. Um, what is, what are the, what are the politics of structural change or structural forms look like in a context where, of an economic downturn when people are losing their jobs? Does it, um, do people become more, is it, is the focus then on more immediate priorities? Does, do people lose their appetite for the, the ideas of structural change or does it go in the other direction? Well, I mean, my experience in government, right, I walked in, we, we walked in in 2009 in the middle of the ep epic downturn, right, shedding 700, 800,000 jobs a month. Um, so, yeah, that absolutely shaped what happened in the Obama transition and what happened in the, in the first, certainly in the first years of the Obama administration. And at some level, it affected the thinking throughout all eight years in that, um, I mean, look, in part, just the governing imperative if things are going this way is that you have to, you have to take steps b because this affects people's lives. You have to take steps to, to level, you know, level the ship, to right the ship and to, and to move forward. And because Washington is not so capable of doing multiple things at a time, other things end up having to fall off the agenda. And so that's just, I mean, that's certainly the way I experienced it. I would argue that wasn't just a matter of you know, a president taking action uh, because of the politics of the issue, there was also, I mean, these were people's lives, people's jobs, people's livelihoods, people's homes. Um, but it did make it really, really difficult to, you know, have the conversation that we wanted to have about climate in the first term. Mm. And we didn't, we weren't able to have the conversation that we wanted to have about climate until the second term, right? Until people were starting to feel more confident about their economic circumstances. So I do, so I do think it is important to to get our heads around now what governing might look like in general, because uh, we, uh, we, what, it, what it takes to campaign is different from what it takes to govern. And, and um, so I think that's a good thing to do no matter what, but to also to get our head, heads around the possibility that you know if we are wildly successful, God willing, and there is a new administration soon, that we may be governing in the context of, of economic constraint. We know that, that we would be governing at a time of kind of extraordinary uh, deficits, and we know the result of incredible financial irresponsibility among the many, many other irresponsible things by this administration. And, um, you know, I've learned that um, for, for all your ambition, governing is constrained by sort of where people are. That affects where the Congress is. Um, and so it's important to think that through. And I, I, I think it's useful, it would be incredibly useful to game that out early rather than in the moment. Yeah, that's great. So in the last few moments that we have, I wanted to turn to some questions that we're getting from, from the audience here. And uh, one, uh, I think this is a great question that, that it, we can ask, we could pose it to, to the whole panel. Um, so the question is, what are, what are the best policies or programs that you've seen that improve economic mobility over the short term? Because um, you know, politicians generally think over shorter term horizons. And then expanding that a little bit, what are, if you look out there, especially at the state and local levels, what are the most interesting or exciting policies, programs, ideas that you've seen out there, things that may be pushing the envelope, or things that you would suggest to the audience to be keeping an eye out for? So. Don't say EITC, right? So stuff that people may not already know about, stuff that's happening out in the hinterlands. So, I think universal family care uh, is a very exciting movement. I think that you know if we can actually look at child care with long-term care, with you know the kinds of all the care that we need along the continuum of life, uh, and then package that in a way where it's most effective and efficient, uh, that we will have done a very good service for the entire nation. Um, in terms of programs that I'm excited about, I 
get this, Social Security. <laughs> it, it does what it was supposed to do. It does what it was designed to do. It is effective. It is efficient. It has created um, you know, the lowest uh, poverty rates among seniors in the, you know, the history of the country. It's, um, and so you know, when you look at how to design policy, I think that it still represents uh, one that is a successful model. Uh, and it's an economic stabilizer in downturns. It's still providing the stimulus that local economies need across the country. Oh, yeah, it's essential. You know, difficult uh, and politically, but but simple. I think uh, resources, income, and near cash matter quite a bit. We know it from the cross disciplinary research, whether it's food stamps, uh, whether it's the the benefits for housing security via programs like <coughs> EITC and TANF. <laughs> uh, uh, but TANF reform is going to be important. If I were going to kind of talk about something on the table that maybe is less discussed. It's sort of in the domain of, of, of skills training. A lot of interesting Obama era um, social innovation fund programs at the local level that were doing um, kind of combinations of community college training, connecting with employers at the local level so that there's actually a job more or less guaranteed at the end of it and providing some on-site supportive services for the actual workers. And I think academics can do a better job of paying attention to how, uh, how popular those programs are, even oversubscribed, um, high quality jobs can move you up the economic yeah, yeah. ladder. Yeah, that there being a, uh, there's a good job at the end of those That's programs. right, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, that's so I agree completely with Maya on universal family care, but I'm gonna give an unconventional answer since she gave the answer that I would have given. Uh, because, the, because immigration reform does not come up in these kinds of spaces, in these kinds of circles, and it is in fact a strategy for economic growth as well as economic mobility, and we don't think of it that way, except that it is. And it, I think it would make a big difference if we began to think about it in these terms, because it's true. Yeah. Tom, last word. Um, so I mentioned antitrust earlier, which is getting a fair amount of discussion, but I think the flip side of that is in part that like, if you look at if you take it out of tech and you look at the utilities, uh, there's actually an enormous economy of scale right now for relocalizing energy production as long as, along with food and beverage production, including a lot of food that can be higher protein, lower fat in, in school lunches uh, and not shipped in from mega ag. So like I sometimes joke that relocalizing production isn't just for uh, survivalists and hipsters anymore. Like it, it's actually an <laughs> enormous potential in the economy that keeps jobs local to home and jobs that may not be coding jobs because some people really like to produce. So I think when we think about antitrust, we know what we're against, which is we want to break up these big companies, some of us do. Um, but it's also about what it reopens, which is the idea of local having sovereignty in the community to think about how you design that community, how you get some of these systems to go together. And they're real sustainable living wage jobs. I think this can obviously be in the context of a Green New Deal as well. Um, so I think we need to reimagine what some of these uh, what it means to do community level or regional level development. And obviously, if you change some of the economic incentives, if you change some of the corporate incentives, that price point shifts very dramatically to the idea of saying, well, of course you would produce some of that within a you know, 60 mile radius of where people are consuming it. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thanks. So 45 minutes, that's structural change. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, good